Welcome to Gardening with Style. A well-designed garden can provide color and vibrancy year-round. The Discovery Garden on the Iowa State Fairgrounds is a perfect example of how something is always in bloom to create a year-round feast for the eyes. This garden could easily be harvested from any time during the growing season and still appear full of life and luster. Cutting gardens are booming in popularity with homeowners. From very simple concepts like a raised bed planted with wildflowers, to a well-designed mix of annuals and perennials such as the Discovery Garden, to planting in rows for the sole purpose of harvesting, there are many ways to accomplish a similar goal. Cindy Haynes takes us on a tour of the horticulture garden in Ames to see one example of how to plan and create your own cutting garden. Welcome to the home demonstration garden and we're standing in the middle of the cut flower garden which has a whole host of some of those annual flowers that maybe you saw at the discovery garden that Aaron mentioned earlier. This one's laid out a little bit differently than the Discovery Garden. Everything is annual in this particular garden, so we lay things out in rows so that I can talk and show you some of the different species. And I think I'll start by showing you the status first, because this is something you recognize. This is something that appears in a lot of cut flower bouquets. It comes in purple and yellow um, and white and really holds up well in uh, cut flower arrangements. Next up, another purple is the Verbena bonariensis. This is a butterfly magnet. It also does a great job of being a, a filler cut flower because they're small little pops of purple. And then this is something called floss flower or ageratum. And it's called floss flower because the petals are very thread-like, like embroidery floss. That's where it got its name. And the cut flower type is really tall and it produces these really nice long stems. So cut flowers, there's several that I wanna show you in the garden. Um, but before we talk about more cut flowers, I wanna point out this one, which isn't a true flower. It's the fruit that we use as a cut flower. This is called Oscar milkweed. It's in the milkweed family and has unusual fruits that also last for a long time in a vase. And with Oscar milkweed, it looks great in a vase because that chartreuse color of those fruit um, really match well or blend well with just about any particular cut flower. Let's go check out some more cut flowers. Welcome to the zinnia patch. Zinnias are a great cut flower and an easy one for anyone to grow. And they come in almost every color of the rainbow. So don't forget zinnias as a cut flower. I also wanted to show you globe amaranth, which looks like a clover, but makes also a fantastic cut flower as well. This one's called fireworks. That one's called strawberry fields because it's red. And then the other row is pom-pom, a -pom, uh, different mix of different colors. Not only is this a great cut flower, it's a great dried flower too. So you can just hang it up to dry and use in bouquets in the future. There's a couple of other gems I want to show you right over here. Now I'm in the celosia aspect of the cutting garden, which has some different types or different forms of celosia. This is a kind of a brain type of celosia. This is more of a plume type celosia. And then there's wheat types of celosia here and here as well. All of these make wonderful cut flowers and they also dry pretty well too. The last thing that I wanna show you um, is with this species of salvia, which is also a really common cut flower. But I wanna show you how to cut and what to do when you're cutting flowers so that they last the longest that they possibly can. And it starts down here. The first thing you have to do is identify a long straight stem. So with the salvia, we've got plenty of opportunities um, to find a nice long straight stem. The second thing you need is a pair of nice sharp shears. Make sure you're using something that's clean and that is as sharp as possible. Cut until you get to a branch. Snip that off. And then what we're gonna do next is strip off the slower foliage. Any of this lower foliage that lasts in the, or gets in the water could create fungal growth. So we wanna make sure we remove all of that lower foliage. And then the most important thing is to put this in a bucket of water as quickly as possible. Don't harvest your flowers without a bucket of water because you put them in water as quickly as possible, they're gonna last a lot longer. 
I'm gonna go harvest a lot more flowers so that next I can show you how to arrange them. We harvested a lot of flowers at the Hort Station in Ames, and we have tons of options to choose from for our cut flower vases today. First though, you're gonna select a vase, pick a vase that you like, that kind of coordinates with your flowers, and that you have about the right amount of flowers that can go into it. You can always add a few other things from your garden, a few greens as well, so that you can kind of fill it out too. The second thing to think about is when you harvest those cut flowers is you want to make sure you put some clean water in the vase. In this particular vase we put water and some rocks in the bottom so we could help stabilize the flowers that we're starting. But when we use that clean water you can add something like the floor life packets or these little packets that you get from a florist. These are really good at providing what flowers need to stay a little bit longer. Clean water if you don't have that. So here is a flower arrangement we've already started. This is just in a simple uh, vase. When you look at the vase, look at the height of the vase because you're going to go about one and a half to two times that height for the height of your flower arrangement, that height and wide. And this one kind of does that pretty well. You also see that with these wildflowers that we've put in here, we've kind of defined the lines that we're going to use for this one too. From then on, I'm just going to start putting a bunch of things randomly around the vase. I might even cut a few of these. Stick them in. The weighty flowers, the bigger flowers, I usually put at the bottom or near the lip of the vase. And then some of the other flowers, I'll scatter them throughout. This pink helps define some line. And this as well. I'm gonna go right here. Some of the things that I've put in this arrangement um, are we put in that gomfrina or that globe amaranth that we used before. We've got some celosia. Here's that Oscar milkweed. We've, I've added some ferns from my garden, a few random zinnias, and then I found a few um, goldenrod from my garden as well, just to kind of keep with that wildflower type theme. Everything in this vase is very wispy. It's very open because that kind of fits with the, the style of the vase and the flowers that I have. Just add a few more things to the front and just leave it nice and open. So this is a vase that we have just flowers that are all the way around and very easy access. When you're considering the flowers that you're gonna use for your vase, take a look at the vase. This is a beautiful vase. It's very rectangular, so it's gonna force you to do two sides to this particular arrangement. It's a very brilliant color, so we used very bold, brilliant flowers in it. And you can kind of see both sides of it. I added some grasses, some variegated grasses, some grass flowers to this one as well. The salvia, some globe amaranth, some zinnias, and some celosia in really bright colors. This one doesn't need too much more. There's a little bit of um, goldenrod in there and status as well. So most, most of this will actually dry pretty well as well. Next up is another little vase. This is, this is a vase almost everyone has. Uh, pure water in it. And I think instead of going something so bold, I'm gonna go with something pretty tame. We'll go with a monochromatic color scheme. And I'm just gonna put a few snapdragons here in the center. 
This is another round vase, so we have lots of opportunity to kind of create this round. Like that one. Flowers. So snapdragons, white snapdragons, globe amaranth. I might even put a little bit of a variegated dogwood in this one for some foliage. want to kind of fill in some of those holes all the way around. You can even use something like hosta leaves to kind of finish this one off. It doesn't have to be fancy. It can be something pretty simple. This one's just got a little bit going on. When you look for things in your garden, wander around and just select things that are blooming because you could often do something that's very simple and just mason jars with the things that are blooming in your garden and not really spend a lot of time actually arranging it, which is kind of a nice way to do it. Go explore your garden, find things that are blooming, look for flowers, look for foliage, and then assemble your own bouquets because you can have a lot of fun with it. I hope Cindy's examples are inspiring you to plan and create your own version of a cutting garden this coming season. As we leave you, here's one more look at the beauty you can experience for yourself at the Discovery Garden at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. Thanks for joining me on Gardening with Style. Coming up on the all new Gardening with Style special. Today, we're talking totally tomatoes. A lot of these wonderful heirloom tomatoes have amazing stories mm -hmm. surrounding them. It's uh, called Willie's Garden Tomato. It's a fairly unique because it's a yellow paste tomato. Every year since I've been married, I uh, planted a garden and my wife says they're good, so here we are. So what do you think makes a tasty tomato? Uh, something that's good on a sandwich. <laughs> we made this beautiful piece of land that's abundant with food, and we want to embrace that and host people here at the farm. The diversity of perennials that can be grown in Iowa is huge. I decided to try to plant my garden for fall color. Oh, look at all the bees. It's only in its second year, but what a butterfly magnet. I work on the perennial bed, uh -huh. and we try to feature perennials that um, bloom throughout the years. Great things come in little packages, and tiny house plants are great additions to the home. My plant passion came from working in the garden with my mom when I was little. People have felt compelled to incorporate more natural elements into their living spaces. Terrariums are a great way to grow house plants. A layer about an inch thick on the bottom of your jars. There's lots of cool, colorful things in there, and I like using this stuff because it's so fun and colorful. Don't miss the all new Gardening with Style special, premiering Saturday, February 19th, only on Iowa PBS. Welcome to Gardening with Style. 
Today's topic is vegetable gardening. You don't have to have a huge yard to grow fresh food. I'll show you one way to utilize small spaces for growing your own vegetables. We'll also visit with a gardener who found a love for vegetable gardening at a very young age. But first, gardeners are known to be very generous with their bounty. We caught up with a group of volunteers from Plantero to see how their local food collection efforts are helping feed the hungry. Carolyn, tell us what Plant a Row for the Hungry is. Well, it's a wonderful way to provide fresh produce for people who might not be able to afford the produce. And it's also a wonderful way for people who garden to be able, when things come on and there's too much, uh, we provide a way to get them to the right people. So as volunteers for Plant a Row for the Hungry, what do you guys do each week? We come to Ryman Gardens on Monday morning. We're here by 7. And we um, advertise that, that gardeners can come and bring their extra produce. We set up tables. Then people drive by. They drop off their extra produce. We weigh the, the produce. And then we pack our cars and take them to Salvation Army, Mid-Iowa Community Action, uh, Primary Health Care, and the Bethesda Food Pantry. Oh, they, the volunteers are just fantastic. I mean, uh, it makes this real easy. You come in once a week. I, I'm not sure I could do it on this scale if I had to make individual deliveries. 15.9. How long are you guys going to be um, doing this? Our schedule is till the third week in October, okay. 24th or something like that. Um, what about it do you find kind of the most rewarding? Well, I guess uh, seeing the people that, uh, that get the produce, uh, usually at each place we go, there are people lined up waiting uh, to get the produce. There's a, there's a great need, even in the community of Ames. This goes to Mid-Iowa Community Food Action. Well, it really feels good when you go to deliver at one of the places and they, the eyes pop open and, and they say, oh, how wonderful. And then when you happen to see the families come and pick up produce, they're so grateful. You know, we don't want people to be hungry and it does feel good to be kind of the middleman between the growers and those who are actually distributing. Volunteer organizations like Plantero exist across the state, and it's easy to get involved, whether you help distribute to those in need or contribute your own produce. A love of gardening can come at any age. We visit with a gardener who found their passion for growing vegetables at a very young age. Hi, this is Brayden, and welcome to my garden. I rent a plot in the community garden. Everyone else here has been gardening longer than I've been alive. This year, I grew zucchini and butternut squash, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, onions, cabbage, and huckleberries. My family's favorite types of tomatoes are white cherry tomatoes and black cherry tomatoes. Everyone always asks me, what are these? These are huckleberries, and my family uses them to make pie. You pick them right before the first frost. Since I have to carry my water across town, I use these coffee cans that funnel down the water to its roots. When digging sweet potatoes, you gotta make sure that you dig farther away from the center of the plant because the roots travel very far. I use ice cream buckets to carry my produce home. Well, the best thing about growing vegetables is that you can eat them. I'm learning how to cook and how to use my garden vegetables. And my favorite thing to make with them is zucchini pancakes. My advice for growing gardens is that you need to rotate where you plant your plants to make sure that the soil doesn't deplete of its nutrients. The most enjoyable part of growing a garden is watching your plants grow and seeing how far you've come. It was fun to show you guys my garden. Thanks for stopping by. 
Growing vegetables in containers is a great way to get fresh food when space or land is not available. Here's how to get the most out of your container grown vegetables. First, you want to start with the right varieties of vegetables. Not everything we typically grow in a vegetable garden will do well in a container, but there are many that will, including things like leafy greens, lettuce, spinach, kale, even microgreens. You can also grow things like herbs, in particular cilantro, basil, and parsley do really well in containers. Looking at other plants, things like bush varieties of cucumber and squash, we want to try to find and select compact cultivars of vegetables whenever we're using them in containers. Eggplant, potatoes, beets, radishes, even peppers, both hot and sweet varieties, do really well in containers. And of course, our favorite, the tomato, is a great addition to a container. Keep in mind when selecting tomato varieties to find and look for either those that are uh, sold as container, great for containers, or those that say they are determinant. Tomatoes come in two types, indeterminate and determinate. Determinate types stay smaller and shorter. They also tend to bloom and fruit in one big lump instead of continuously throughout the season. Once we know what we're going to be growing in our containers, we need to pick the right container. And in most cases, as large as we can get it is what we want to do. Even as big as this one would be great. They can be any kind of material from terracotta to glazed. They can be uh, plastic. Um, they can be things like this window box here. Uh, and smaller vegetables like the leafy greens or herbs can do well in smaller containers or things like this window box, but larger vegetables, in particular things like potatoes, peppers, and tomatoes need to be in a large container. I'm going to be using for our uh, example here today just an old nursery container. The price was right on this one. I'm reusing it from something I planted earlier in the season, and it has both of the things I'm looking for in a container for vegetables. It's good sized, and it has great drainage at the bottom. Once we have our container, we need to fill it with something uh, that works well in container. Garden or topsoil, which is usually really inexpensive in the stores, is not good for containers. That garden soil or topsoil changes structure when we put it in a container, and it tends to be too wet and not provide enough air for the roots to grow well. Instead, we want to look for a good quality potting mix, even though it is a little bit more expensive. Ideally, we would fill the container with potting mix. If the container is really large and you're worried about moving it or are having a hard time being able to get all the potting soil to fill it, you can put voids in it, things like upside down containers, uh, peanut, packing peanuts in a plastic bag, pool noodles, those kinds of things can help fill some of the void. But hopefully you can fill it with all with soil because a good soil volume means we have plenty of water and nutrients available for our vegetables to do well. Now that we have our container and I have it full of soil, I am going to uh, pot up our, our vegetables here. And I have here just a, a, a seedling of a tomato that I'm going to place in this container. If we were growing something from seed, like a lot of the greens are grown and even some herbs, we can sow the seed directly onto the surface of this and then cover it with the right amount of soil, which it says on the back of the package. Otherwise, we're just going to transplant this into the container. And pop it out and set it in. When we get done with this, this plant's going to look a little lonely in this container, and that's okay. These things get much larger throughout the season, so don't worry about that. Don't be tempted to fill it in with other little things unless you're planning to remove those things later on in the season. Once we have it planted, we need to get it watered. We always water in newly planted things, and watering is one of the most important and can be one of the more challenging things about growing vegetables in containers. The reason why this is such an important factor is because most vegetables, including things like tomatoes, need a good, consistent source of moisture, and containers are so much more likely to dry out than a vegetable garden in your yard would be. And so being on top of that watering is critical to doing a good job of producing high-quality vegetables that you're really happy to eat. You might want to use some fertilizer as well, although most potting mixes that you find in the store now have a slow-release fertilizer in them. You don't want to overdo the fertilizer in these containers. We, uh, too much fertilizer for vegetables often means a lot of leafy growth and very little fruiting, flowering and fruiting. Uh, so the, if the potting soil you have had 
a fertilizer in it, you're probably good. You can use something like a slow release fertilizer, which I prefer to use, or water every once in a while with a water soluble fertilizer um, throughout the season. The last thing we're going to do is make sure that this container gets put in the best location for light. All vegetables need full sun to perform their best. And uh, in particular, things like peppers and tomatoes, all the bush varieties of cucumbers and squash, they will need full sun, at least six hours of light hitting the leaves. If you don't have quite full sun, some vegetables like a lot of the leafy greens, some of the herbs, will do okay with a little bit less light, but they still need as much light as possible if you can't quite get six hours of direct sunlight a day. Vegetable gardening can be one of the most rewarding forms of gardening and one of the easiest to start with. It gets you connected with the outside and nature and you get food. It's the perfect way to introduce kids to gardening and healthy foods, getting them engaged in the great outdoors and invested in trying new food. Nothing tastes better than a vine ripened tomato or fresh sweet corn grown by your own hands in your own garden, whether it's in your yard or in a container on your patio. Thanks for joining me on Gardening with Style.